let me talk a bit about the Labor Video Project. The Labor Video Project started in 1983. Uh, it, to, and what we felt was is that working people needed uh, labor programming on television because most people get their information on TV. Uh, that's how they get their information. And if labor is not on TV, you're kind of marginalized. If people don't see it on TV, it's not out there for a lot of people. So we felt uh, that it's with community access television that it's important that labor have programming, regular programming on television. So we started our show called Labor on the Job, which is an hour-long TV show. It's produced twice a month, and it's in San Francisco, Philadelphia, um, St. Louis, and Sacramento and on cable. And we also have another show which we produce called Labor Line, which is a weekly one-half-hour one labor show. And we started a network called the Union Producers and Programmers Network in 1989, which is a network of labor video producers and radio producers, including uh, Labor Radio, Workers Independent News, Labor Radio. I don't know if people know about that. But it is the only daily radio news program in the United States. Every day it has it. And you can listen to it on the internet. You can put it on your website. And it has regular programming of working people. So we felt that this propaganda against labor, the corporate onslaught against labor, requires that labor have a labor media strategy. We have to use new technology, the internet and, and video and media, to get our stories out. Um, and we've been pushing within the AFL-CIO and Change to Win, all unions, for, a late, for the development of a 24-hour labor channel, labor video channel, in which unions could have regular labor news and information going out on nationally and internationally. And we formed a network called the International Labor Media Network. Uh, and the idea is to get programming from all over the world uh, in different languages and have it on this channel so people can see what's going on on a global level as well as a US level. So we've been fighting at the AFL-CIO convention. We've been fighting in many unions for the development of this channel. And one of the things that we think is very important and we've been doing is to have forums on issues facing the labor movement. One of them is change to win and what's happening with Change to Win. And the other is what's going on within the SEIU. The SEIU is the largest union in the United States, as everyone knows, 1.8 million. It's important that people know what is happening in the union and also the effect of the mergers and other changes that have going on with the, within the SEIU. So for that reason, we had a forum in San Francisco a couple of months ago on the SEIU, an open forum. We invite people with different points of view, including the leadership as well as rank and file people, uh, to present their points of view. Because what we feel is necessary is that there be a democratic debate and discussion on what's facing working people, whatever your point of view. So we can have a discussion, information, and people can clarify uh, what is going on in the labor movement. First of all, I was a rank and file in SEIU. I was a social worker in Monterey County, Child Protective Service social worker, and I got involved in the union. I then, from that experience, became a union field rep, and now I'm back on the line as a social worker. So I've sort of gone full, cir full circle on this thing. And the, quite frankly, the reason I got involved as a rank and filer is because I believed in the, the philosophical underpinnings of trade unionism and SEIU, and I really still believe that the members themselves are the strength of SEIU, the difficulty now is that we have no voice. Um, as a staff person, uh, I went through the change to win. I was on the cheerleading team, uh, you know, tr trying to help our rank and file understand why it was important for us to break away from the AFL-CIO. I had a very unique experience, uh, which I'll, since I've got 10 or 15 minutes, I'll share it. Um, I was actually a delegate on our Central Labor Council for the Monterey Bay and was elected by all the unions to represent our Labor Council at the AFL-CIO convention in July of 2005. And imagine my shock, by the time I was getting off the plane, literally Andy Stern and the crew from Change to Win were holding a press conference saying that we were, they were pulling out of AFL-CIO. So at, the, at that particular time, I, I should say I was with SEIU Local 535, the only statewide local in SEIU besides Local 1000. I called my director at the time for 535. I said, what should I do? I'm here representing the Labor Council, but obviously SEIU has 
you know, some pull with me, some weight with me. And they said, just go to the convention, you know, listen, take notes, you know, see, see what's going on with the NAFL CIO. So I did. But on the, the last day of the convention, after every, you know, and if, you, if you've ever been to any of those conventions, you look up there and you see they're all fat cats, you know, the AFL-CIO people, um, literally. So, so you know, jo, jo, yeah, jo, black, white, brown, whatever, they're all, you know, you see they've got those big fat paychecks sticking out of their pocket. Um, so. The last day of the convention, after the trashing in particular of SEIU, I'm on my third day of being beat up, you know, sitting there and all my fellow uh, uh, AFL-CIOs are chuckling, you know. I mean, uh, they were very supportive. I sat with the machinists, is who I sat with, and they were like, it's okay, Ren, it's okay, you know. And so finally John Sweeney got up and gave this roaring speech about kicking SEIU out and blah, 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 and I said, and he goes, now I want to hear from the delegates on the floor. So I like flew to that microphone and I could see, I thought, okay, this is it. They're going to take me down. I mean, I really thought they're going to, you know, kill me or beat me with a bat or something, the, the old um, Teamster days. And I went up to the podium and sure enough, like, you know, these sort of, you know, the gang of AFL sort of hovered around me. And I just got up there and I said, look, you know, I just gave a little speech, okay, about loving SEIU and yet loving my labor council and that this wasn't right, what they were planning to do. And I, you know, I urged him not to do it. I said, this is, this is democracy in action. Our union members need to see blah, blah. I don't know, you know, I just went off and said this little speech, right? And I engaged John Sweeney. He started, you know, yakking at me from the, the microphone, like, okay, young lady, you can sit down now, honey. You don't really know anything. You don't really know what's going on. So at that point, I was ready to faint, and I walked off the podium, and they sort of, the AFL-CIO people sort of escorted me out of the, out of the, the place. And um, suddenly, I saw these UFCW members or SEIU members, they came running at me, and they were like, oh my god, you, you, you said what we wanted to say, but we didn't have a backbone, kind of thing. And I'm like, great, thanks for letting me you know, hang out there by myself. But anyway, the point of it was, I, I did it because somebody had to stand up for what I believed was the real, true thing, the change to win. We were going to make a difference. We were going to turn the world around, you know, because it wasn't happening in FLCIO. So I walked out, and I got back on a plane, and I was on my way home, and I get a call from Andy Stern. Now, I never met Andy Stern, but all, suddenly Andy Stern's on the phone. I thought it was a friend of mine joking around with me, you know, and I'm like, yeah, okay, okay, right, 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 you know. And then finally I go, wait a minute, I've heard that voice before. I'm thinking, oh my God, it is Andy Stern, okay. So I'm not starstruck, okay? Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, those are my starstruck people, but, but not Andy Stern. Um, so he says, I want to thank you for what you did at the AFL-CIO convention. It was a very courageous thing for you to do. And I said, well, it wasn't courageous. It was just what I needed to do. And he said, well, I want to thank you for supporting me. And, and I just, like at that moment, it was, you know, defining moments, I thought to myself, thank you for supporting you. I didn't, and I just said, I said, you know, Andy, I appreciate that you called me, but I didn't do this for you. I did this for the members that I represent. I really believe that we're going to do something with this change to win. And, and suddenly he just said, okay, well, thank you very much, and clunk. And at that moment, when I could not engage him in a dialogue on that point, I mean, I fully expected him to say, you are absolutely right, Ren. This is really about blah, 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 he hung up on me and I went, oh my God, I have been snookered, I've been, you know, the, anything with those rose-colored glasses, it's gone now, and now I'm finally like sort of seeing what some other people have been telling me, and you know, Ren, you're too naive, blah, 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 and okay, so from there is where it goes now to the, you know, the change to win, for me personally, we always had great relationships with our fellow unions down in Monterey, Santa Clara County. Change to win, it didn't mean anything different. No, business, it was business as usual for, for the rank and filers on the road. Um, 
so now we go to, now we move forward a year and now we're doing this, uh, you know, the uh, consolidation of the unions. And I did a lot of digging, obviously, from that experience. I started doing a lot of research. I, I have a lot of buddies, you know, that are in social workers in Massachusetts. I started calling them up to find out, well, what happened over there? I got documents. They, I talked to their different chapter members, staff people, presidents. And I got a different, you know, picture of what was happening with these consolidations. So I like to send material out. So I sent it out. I just sent it to rank and filers, I sent it to staff people, and suddenly I was starting to get labeled as a, tr you know, a troublemaker, and when, when, or you're against Andy, or you're against SEIU in this process, and I was like, I haven't even, I don't even have an opinion right now. I'm just trying to find out the information. But just that simple, very simple d democratic principle of educating yourself and spreading the information was looked upon as, as, um, you know, against Andy Stern, against management of SEIU. So, and I was a vice president of my own union within my staff, and even there, there was suspicion of, well, what are you doing, Ren, or why do you have to be so feisty, or why do you have to challenge management? And my philosophy has always been, you know, management, no matter where they are, are bad, period. Prove it to me that you're different, and that's the way that I've, you know, survived to the age of 56, so it's done me well. Um, but, so this isn't, it isn't about me, I don't want to, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm Irish and tell a little humor along the way, but um, it became very clear to me that there was not going to be a place for me in the new local. They were trying to get rid of me. Um, they attempted to get rid of me, but of course, there was not, they had no basis to get rid of me. But I could see the writing was on the wall. I could see that there were little smear whisper campaigns going on. So I, I told every staff person, you better have a plan B and you better have a plan C. Because these people are going to be ruthless. When it comes down to the wire, they're going to use us, they're going to abuse us, and then they're going to kick us to the side. They don't want institutional memory. They do not want people that they perceive as any threat to their power base. They absolutely do not want staff people that actually connect and are engaged with the rank and file, okay, because that is a perceived threat. And so I knew that and, you know, so I put the scarlet letter on and um, I did find I had a plan B and a plan C in terms of employment. And when it came down to the wire, they, you know, they sit you in a little room and they say, well, we'll give you this if you sign this piece of paper. Oh, and by the way, you know, I really helped orchestrate a union for the new staff in the North, 1021, and in the Central, 521. So that I carried that one too with CWA. Um, that was also a perception like, you know, she's trying to destroy what we have here. So they offered me a route, and I, I had Monterey, part of Monterey, and I had a part of Santa Clara, um, and, and I should say, and I also have a disability of a knee, so I, you know, I can't drive long, long, long distances without brakes. So they offered me a route that would have left me in a car driving 16 to 18 hours a day, literally. But, but because we were trying to get our union in, and my vote counted in terms of union, I said, okay, I'll sign. We all agreed we'd sign no matter what. So I signed the paper to accept the job, knowing full well that there was no physical way that I could work 16 hours, 16 to 18 hours, seven days a week. That was literally impossible. Um, so it came down to the wire, February 28th. We were moved into the new entity. On March 2nd, I was fired. Now, I had already accepted a job with Santa Clara County as the social worker because I knew, you know, it was just, I knew it was coming. So I landed very well on my feet, uh, me personally. I, there were staff that were released. They did not believe it would really happen. And they, they were without jobs. They are still without jobs. Um, they've been blackballed within SEIU, and of course now even within Change to Win, there have been smear campaigns done against other staff people that are having difficulty finding employment or permanent employment. They can find little temporary stints. There have been some sort of braver unions that have actually hired some of, the st some of our staff that were, were let 
excuse me, let go. Um, but it's still in, everything is in limbo right now. All these staff that were left behind are all on probation. They're all at-will employees. They, they've taken already a 25% reduction in their wage and benefit package. And I, probably none of you hear this because the staff don't really let the rank and file know. They've been told you cannot let the rank and file know or you will be gone because you are at will. So I've run into some of those staff and they see me and they run the other way. And I'm not kidding. They are so scared of losing their jobs. And I mean, I personally, I, I think it's horrific that people have to live in their fear, but I understand. People have families to support, kids to put through college, little kids to put through whatever, you know, food, clothing, shelter. And so fear is running their lives right now from the staff perspective. Um, from the rank and file perspective now that I'm on the line paying 90 bucks a month for union dues, I get no information. Even the officers of the chapter that I'm part of will not allow me to participate. They refuse to let me be a shop steward. Uh, I tried to represent as a friend a, a, a worker who was facing a disciplinary action when, when I was the union rep, we had gotten her uh, disciplinary action down, but it was a bogus charge, so we were going to proceed in the old 535 with getting her an attorney and going to the appeal board, but we were told as staff, come March 1st, everything's going to be dropped, so get, get it taken care of before February 28th, or we're just, it's going to go into the black hole and you'll never see the grievance or the disciplinary action appeal done. Well, this particular worker, who is a friend, we just kept pushing, pushing 521. They canceled four meetings, they canceled three appeals board, and finally they sent her a letter saying, oh, we believe what management said in the county, so we're not gonna represent you. Good luck in your future. So we kept, my cha old chapter president here, Linda and I sat with this worker, we, we put the package of things together for her. We went up to San Jose, now after it's been canceled four times, we went up there for an appeals hearing with supposedly three stewards. The second they saw me, they turned beet red, they ran out, they started making phone calls, and suddenly the stewards didn't show up. And then within that week, I got a letter, an email saying, if you show up, we will not have this appeal hearing with this worker. So I called the worker, I said, look, here's the reality. If they cancel it again, you know, we did get them to reschedule the appeals hearing, for, uh, the, st the personnel board hearing, but I had to help her and Linda to put the package together so that they could then proceed with it because I said this is about me now this cannot be about me your this is your money okay as soon as they see me in there they're gonna go freaking ballistic so d take me out of the equation and see if you could get a fair shot at really talking to this th these three shop stewards but again from what I understand it was already a setup deal the the management had already you know, the packets they give the workers is only what management gave them. So they have none of all the corroborating info. I did interviews. I had 15 interviews that I had done with staff and clients and in Spanish and this and that and put the whole package together. The, the stewards didn't have any of that. But we gave it to them in their packet to read. God only knows if they'll get it. But that, that's the kind of representation that people are getting now in 521. If you don't have a union contract, it's like pulling teeth to get a union contract. I've gotten into fights with the officers. New workers come on board and they, you know, I, at the work site I am identified, you know, as a, everybody knows I'm a former, un, the union rep, the former union rep. So they always come to me with their issues. And I tell them, well, you know, I'm, not, I'm on probation. <laughs> you know? you got to go to Joe Blow and Jane Doe. And they said, well, we've already been to them, and they won't help us. We can't even get a contract. So then I go, give them a contract. And I literally have to fight at the work site to get workers a contract. And then maybe, excuse me, two to three weeks later, they get it. So it's like we're getting nothing. It's, it's like the show's over. Just take our money and run, and there is absolutely no accountability and it makes me sick in my heart it makes me sick in my stomach that I see these officers and I see these the president Christy Semmershine and some of her you know minions that that 
really try to act as if this is a democratic union. It's not. Most recently, I had a friend who was asked to be on the, uh, an advisory committee of 521 to advise the executive board members. And by the way, nobody was elected, right? Everybody was just appointed by Andy Stern. So there is no democracy. The letters said, we'd like to have you. Your name has been put forward. But if you are not going to you know, go with our program, don't even bother responding to this letter. This, I have it right here. I'll read it to you. It says, you will need to be supportive of the work of the new union and the direction we are going. If you have doubts about the direction of the new consolidated union, you should not volunteer to be considered. Now that's right out of the letter. So this is how it is. Oh, I hear your story today, and I just want to let you know that um, I went to work for Kaiser in 1985, SEIU Local 250, hospital and healthcare workers uh, under Tim Toomey. Um, I believe John Sweeney was president of SEIU International at the time, and now he's president of the AFL-CIO. God help us all. Anyway, my friend April worked there a lot longer than I did. I was a union steward starting in 87. I got injured on the job. I was fired. SEIU did nothing to help me. Um, I went back to work in another position. I got suffered more injuries, repetitive stress injuries, because what they did was that they combined a lot of jobs together. I'm still discovering a lot of things that, that went on. Uh, we went through a lot of psychological abuse at Kaiser, and uh, a lot of abuse was towards the workers and also towards the patients, and that what we didn't realize is that we as employees were patients too. So what we had predatory supervisors, and we had a SEIU union under Selrozelli, that did absolutely diddly squat, nothing. I mean, we were going out the door like flies. I have got over about 100 people from Kaiser that have gone out on workers' comp, have ended up on S uh, Social Security, Disability, Medicare, and a lot of people haven't been able to get their pensions, their health care that they were promised under their contract. Um, and we, in, when Steve mentioned suicide, we've had about seven suicides at Kaiser, both South Sac and uh, North Sacramento. I still talk with injured workers from Kaiser, and the union still does nothing for them. Uh, I, I understand the union dues are well over $50 now a month, and they don't hear from anybody. Um, I, I became a union steward, and then from there I became a Sacramento Central Labor Council uh, executive board member. And that's when I really started finding out that the union really doesn't do anything. And I had presented to the Labor Council about all the c causes of action that were going on at Kaiser related to the stress issues. And next thing I know, all the union heads had their employees take Kaiser for their medical care, which I found pretty astounding. Anyway, I've been rep still representing Kaiser workers, still trying to help them get their Social Security, help them with their injured workers, their worker compensation, which is a nightmare from hell, uh, along with the fraud assessment. I've been to every department in the state of California trying to get help for people, whatever way we can possibly get. Still, you know, I've been banging on a lot of doors and the doors haven't been open. Um, SEIU under Sal Roselli is probably, you know, I can't cuss here, but I'm gonna stay, try and stay a lady as much as possible. But he's a very evil man. And when I heard about all the unions going directly under without democracy, well, we didn't have democracy either. Now, they encouraged me to be a union steward, and I did so. I went gun ho then be all of a sudden, like you, I became a troublemaker, which I didn't understand. I thought, that's what you want. <laughs> you want to fight for your, fight for your employees. And um, I'm still looking, and I'm still trying. April, several of us are still looking for justice for those injured workers, the ones that are dead, the ones that didn't get their medical care. And uh, uh, I just say that we have an uphill battle, but you know, wherever there's life, there's hope to me. Thank you. My name is uh, Dan Mariscal. I am a Los Angeles City employee. I'm a truck operator for the Bureau of Street Services, Department of Public Works in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I would like to start off by giving a big thanks to Mr. Steve Zeltzer for stepping up and filling a, a much needed void of getting the information out there. And that's we seem to be very short on information uh, last few years. 
And this is uh, going to be a lot more important than maybe what a lot of people realize. Uh, as far as our, our involvement with SEIU, I've been a uh, SEIU member for about 16, 17 years. I've also been a union steward for about that long. And keeping up with our tradition, we fight on behalf of our members. And we continue to fight on behalf of our members to this day, even if it is against union management. And uh, I am proud to be among the uh, people labeled as troublemakers. Uh, I do make trouble for people who, uh, who cause injustice on our members. And if that's the label I'm going to wear, I wear it proudly. Uh, and as far as uh, us being against SEIU, no. We are not against SEIU. What we are against is anybody who comes along and tries to take our voice, tries to take our choices, tries to take over our rank and file without their consent. Anyone who tries to separate us, anyone who tries uh, to fight what's for best for our members. And especially we are against people who cannot even treat their own employees with the same dignity and respect that we are all fighting for. Thank you. And as far as the information, the information uh, has not been forthcoming. Despite all the questions we've been asked, all the, uh, the pleas for information, and we, we've been met with silence. And that caused us great concern to the point that uh, when the consolidation came around, uh, they consolidated first and asked questions later. While this proved to be to their detriment in the city of Los Angeles because we filed a, uh, an opposition to this request for a consolidation, it's called an amended certification. And unbeknownst to Andy Stern, obviously, uh, you cannot represent the city of Los Angeles unless you have a certification from the Employee Relations Board. And apparently he didn't think about that. So when he came to uh, file for this amended certification, he opened the door and we jumped in. And we filed a, an opposition to that. We currently have a, a hearing before the board for them to hear the matter of the consolidation. And that's scheduled for August 21st. Uh, the hearing officer is Ms. Jerry Lou Kozak, who happens to teach at one of the universities out here up north, which is a very good sign. And as far as uh, our staff is concerned, uh, SEIU 721 basically swallowed up our staff, and they had a mass firing of, uh, of former, former 660 staff members. The staff was so against these kinds of practices that they picketed SEIU 721 right outside their headquarters and staged a statewide sick out. Now if they're not going to buy what they're selling, I don't think us employees should buy it either. And we're not. We're going to fight this tooth and nail and it looks good for us. They made a lot of mistakes uh, trying to get this consolidation going. They stepped over too many toes and they just basically uh, gave us the mushroom treatment, feeding us a lot of uh, stuff and keeping us in the dark. What I think basically where we're headed, we're headed for a revolt, a much needed revolt. Because little did Andy Stern know what he was going to do. He was going to galvanize this labor movement and give us a focal point that was long needed, that the rank and file members need to take our union back. It was taken away from us like a thief in the night. This consolidation issue uh, in 2006 that was voted on was of a question of whether or not we should consolidate for more, quote, power, unquote. He didn't say who the power was, was for. He didn't say who was going to control this power. Didn't give any hint, didn't answer any questions, but what he did do was that he silenced the staff. And he issued a memo saying, 
that if you're not on board, you need to be quiet. Do not use any of the resources. Do not use any of the information. Do not use any of the dues money to oppose this. And our staff was pretty much was gagged and tied. We would ask our staff, what's going on? I can't talk about it. But we're paying you. I can't talk about it. Or else. So at a time that we needed our staff the most, couldn't use it. To organize, we would need our dues money. Couldn't use that either. So that's why we banded together. So the only one we can use is ourselves. We circulated petitions, and to our surprise, our enemy really wasn't Andy Stern. It's apathy. That's who we were really fighting against. People who really just don't care. That's how Andy Stern was able to get in, into, uh, into this position he's in right now. The way the vote came about in 2006 is that we have in California approximately 30% of the 1.8 million people, which comes out to about 600,000. I'm not sure how many ballots went out, but when the final vote came down, 36,000 ballots were counted, a little under 36,000, which is only 6% of the 600,000 members. The memo came out, the vote was uh, tallied, and by their standards, they'd won. 88% of the 36,000 ballots that were counted were in favor of the consolidation. I thought that a little strange. 600,000 members, and they only counted 36,000 ballots. Hmm. The question is, did the 600,000 members receive ballots? Probably not. And here's another issue in regards to that. Can you honestly say that an election was valid if only 6% of the membership voted? You can't. And this is how they were able to, to get in there and tell our employee relations board that a vote did happen. By their standards, I guess you could say that. But that's not going to survive the scrutiny that we're going to give it. Our battle, rather, is with our members to tell them what's going on and why they should care, why the information needs to be out there, and why they need to know about it. Because what happens is, when it's too late, then the members feel the pain and ask what's going on. I thought we were supposed to vote. I thought that we were supposed to be in control. What happened? Well, basically what happened is you weren't listening. And this is why this video project is so important into a medium where we can get out to the members because that's this consolidation, this injustice, that's their greatest enemy, information. And that's what we need to get out there. We need to get out to the information and tell them why they should care. And we should emphasize what's going to happen if they don't care. We're seeing the results of that as we speak. We're seeing members lose benefits over in 535. When they had their uh, merger, they merged into 721. The CAO from the LA County basically says, oh, I guess we don't have to pay your benefits anymore. You're in a different union. You're not part of the coalition. And they had to fight to get their benefits back. They had to do it. 721 can't jump in there and take credit. They might. But the members of 535 had to band together. That's an example of what's going to have to happen. We are going to have to band together. 
And I'm very happy to see people coming together now and linking arms. That's what it's going to take to get our union back. There's been fights all over uh, the state because they've seen some of the detriment that this consolidation has caused in their own workers. The disconnect between the workers and the staff. You can't have an effective union that way. I'm sorry. We seem to have lost direction on where it is that we're supposed to be going. And as far as leadership is concerned, a lot of people are of the, of the opinion that uh, Mr. Stern is done. We have reached the point of diminished returns. Major changes, minimum results. It's time to go. It's just time to go. And this is the message that our members wanted me to bring here. We need to link arms. We need to pass information. We need to connect. We need to come together and do what unions do, fight for our members. My name is Ed Perez, and I'm a member of SCIU Local 1000. Uh, we represent state employees across uh, California. Uh, I've been a SCIU member since, I think, 19, 1991. I entered state service in 1990. Um, I joined the union about a, about a year after I, I entered state service. And in fact, I, I still remember the day I actually joined. Uh, you know, we had a, I work in a small office with maybe about 20 people in it in San Rafael. And um, one of our staff, I still remember his name, Carl Jaramillo, uh, came in with pizza. You know, <laughs> and um, I was the only one who showed up at the meeting. <laughs> but uh, apparently it was successful because I, I joined, so he, he met us a quota of, of recruiting a member. Um, and I, I mention that because, you know, later on as I go through my um, uh, statements, um, you know, you're going to hear people, um, like you said, be labeled troublemakers. And, and I, quite frankly, I don't mind being called a troublemaker, and I'm very honored to be in a room full of them. Um, I still have that book, you know, Guidebook for Troublemakers. Um, what I don't like, though, and the one that really gets to me is when I'm called anti-union. You know, when, just because I happen to have a different perspective of what unionism, unionism should be. And um, so what I'd like to do, uh, oh, before I start, there was one thing I wanted to tell you. I was going to start my um, presentation today by saying that you know, uh, Local 1000's situation is slightly different than other SEIU locals. And, and by God, the more I hear from Ren and um, uh, the gentleman there from L.A., um, it, it's scary. I mean, I mean, I actually, you know, I get goosebumps when I was listening to a lot of the stuff you were telling me. And, uh, and, and it turns out we, we were not as dissimilar from, from you. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of go through a history of CSEA, which is an organization that we're part of. And hopefully along the process, you'll see a lot of the similarities to what you're running into today. Um, C the California State Employees Association, or CSEA, uh, was started back in the 30s. And it was started because, uh, you know, back in the late 20s, a group of state employees uh, many of them were managers, by the way, uh, you know, got together and, and proposed something very dramatic, uh, very, very novel at the time to the governor. They wanted to come up with a pension system for state employees. You know, think about it. This is the 20s, right? And it was very dramatic because back then hardly anybody had pensions. Um, and you know, you know what happened in the 30s, right? The, the golden years for the, for the labor movement. Uh, so that small group got thrown out of the governor's office. <laughs> But anyway, they, you know, they didn't give up. Um, they actually campaigned, and there was a state proposition that eventually created the state pension system, and that's what we now call CalPERS, which is worth God knows how much now, $250, $280 billion. Um, and since that time, CSEA has won a lot of the benefits that a lot of us state employees enjoy. Um, CSEA actually provided health benefits 24 years before the state offered it. Uh, it, it helped create the Golden One Credit Union that a lot of our members belong to. In fact, our connection to Golden One is so close that the CSEA headquarters in Sacramento is actually co-owned by Golden One. You know, 
but because it's uh, basically a bank, it's split up. <laughs> uh, but they still call it the building. The, one of the biggest changes that occurred in CSEA was in the late 70s. Uh, most state workers don't know this, and we really need to get this out there. But we didn't get the right to collectively bargain for a contract until about 1978. That's when the DILS Act was created. And you know, as expected, you know, it was challenged in court. The Supreme Court eventually weighed in and ruled it essentially constitutional. So it wasn't until about the early 80s that CSEA started hold, uh, winning elections to represent the state workforce. Uh, the state workforce was divided into 21 bargaining units, and CSEA won a lot of them. Uh, trouble started, though, in the, I think, around early 80s, because AFL unions were starting to raid CSEA bargaining units. And that period is critical because that's when we first got involved with SCIU. As most of you know, in the AFL-CIO Constitution, I think it's Article 20, Article 20 prohibits any AFL-CIO union from raiding the bargaining units of other unions that are with the AFL-CIO. So CSEA, being an independent association at the time, uh, actually set up a committee to look at different AFL unions that we can affiliate with. They actually um, looked uh, at AFSME, I think. Um, SEIU obviously was one of the ones on the list. And, and I know this because, uh, ironically, my labor relations officer in the department I work with was part of that committee. <laughs> um, and eventually we settled with SEIU. And one of the things that sort of pushed the envelope for SEI, or you know, pushed us towards SEIU was, at the time, uh, we were sort of the big fish in California public workers, you know? It's a big association, we had a big membership. Um, so SEIU was very, very happy to see us, you know, be on board. But CSEA also was concerned about independence. And one of the things we had, um, agreed to with SEIU, uh, we have a, what, was, what we call an affiliation, affiliation agreement. And in the affiliation agreement, it, it gave CSEA a very, very strong independence. In fact, um, one thing that's different with our affiliation agreement than with other, other SEIU locals is that in our agreement, SEIU, the international, actually cannot put us into trusteeship without our permission, if you can believe that. And that's very relevant for you guys in 347, 535. So SEIU just can't come in and reorganize us. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why we're, we were really not part of the California merger. Um, but um, anyway, um, as, a, as a side, um, one of the reasons I got involved heavily with the union was that when I first got involved in the early 90s, about 93, I think, or 94, uh, CSEA at the time wasn't uh, very close to SCIU. It was still an association. And many of us uh, that were, you know, believers in rank and file control uh, felt that we needed to reform the association so that we, like you said, we can have real rank and file control. So I joined an organization, a reform group called the Caucus for a Democratic Union, or CDU. I was in CDU for quite a while. Um, in fact, I was a... Um, I was in the convention in 2000 in Pittsburgh. I was an alternate there. I was also a delegate to the SEIU convention in San Francisco. Um, so I was, you know, one of the few people that actually helped the reform movement bring us closer to SEIU. And just like many of you, uh, a lot of us that were in CDU were very gung-ho supporters of SEIU. In fact, in 2000, before we even had purple shirts. I came back from Pittsburgh really gung-ho. I was wearing purple before there were purple shirts, <laughs> you know? Uh, and for us in the reform movement, uh, the biggest day came in 2003 when we elected enough people in offices and elected enough delegates uh, that we were able to elect the, off the, the officers of CSEA. The, thought of most people in CDU at the time was, okay, we've served our purpose. This, this organization that was started to reform the union, give us real rank and file control, has served its purpose. And we thought we were just gonna bury the organization and you know, we'll reach out to our other affiliates, the retirees, the, 
excluded employees and the state university employees, and we'll be one big happy family. Well, unfortunately, after 2003, CDU stayed on. And instead of being a reform movement, it essentially became a political machine to keep certain people in power. And Dave Burkholder over there can attest to that. Um, so at that point, a lot of us in CDU started thinking about what we were hearing, just like uh, Ren was talking about, where people were telling her things that you need to be watching out for. And like you said, I don't know if we were naive or we just had a bigger you know, picture to look at. But you know, before 2003, we, we already had issues where people were concerned about union democracy. Um, does member run mean four people running the union? Or is it a lot of us members doing it? Um, we also had issues with CSEA. The CSEA leadership at the time um, warned us. And I'm, listen to this very carefully. They warned us. In, in 2000, once SEIU takes over, they're going to get rid of CSEA. Once they take over, your dues are going to go up. Once they take over, if you think we don't give you democracy now, you're not going to see it anymore. And like I said, after 2003, the brick wall just hit my head. And a lot of us had the same experience. Alex is nodding his head. So finally, all that boiled over, um, and we ended up creating a new movement <laughs> to reform the reform movement. And that's what my shirt is. It's uh, California State Employees United. It, we just, this was formed, uh, again, precisely to counteract. And to me personally, uh, I got involved really to help undo, unfortunately, part of the damage that I helped create. Uh, I, I don't regret my time with CDU. I, it had its purpose. This is why we're very active. We learn from the best as far as organizing, getting people involved. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, it's just, you know, we're here to help undo part of the damage. Um, and hopefully, if we're successful, I would like to see CSE United disbanded <laughs> because that's what it's for. It was meant to, to, to do a certain purpose. And once that purpose is achieved, it should be gone uh, um, and, and go from there. So that's essentially how I got involved. Um, and Dan brought up that issue that comes up very, very timely for us. Um, we had a dues vote in 2006. And um, a year before, when we had our statewide elections, when our officers were running for office, um, we were warning people that we were hearing behind the scenes that they were going to raise our dues. And the idea was hopefully we were going to get discussions about, okay, why do we need it? Uh, if we do need it, are there any other avenues we need to explore? And ideally, if, if they convince us that it's needed, then we need to get the members involved and, and get their buy-in, right? After all, they're the ones who are going to be paying the dues. Uh, that didn't happen. It's the same thing with you. Uh, the, the political apparatus within our union just thought they had the votes, and they did. You know, most of the delegates were people that were brand new. Uh, they passed the dues increase, but it left such a bad taste in, in, the, in the mouths of our members that it created this swell of anger and unfortunately, that's the kind of anger that other, you know, sort of anti-labor groups latched onto. And unfortunately, we're being sort of tied to those groups. And, and that's why I was telling Ren earlier, uh, you know, you can call me any name you want, but the minute you call me anti-union, it really gets under my skin. Um, so, but anyway, but, but we know that's what they're going to do. They're going to try to paint us as anti-union. Um, you know, I spent about 10 years of my life, you know, putting my career on hold. And uh, for me, it was worth it. There was a very good reason to do it. And unfortunately, the more, you know, I, I do this stuff, the more I find less, less reason to try to do it. Um, but I, I want to stay in there long enough so that we can, we can get to that point, of, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and we'll have a chance in 2008 when we have our statewide elections 
wonderful activists that I'm proud to be amongst you, you coming this long, long distances. From, uh, I think from LA and Bay Area, Santa Cruz, I admire you. I respect you. Everybody here talked about issues that we have in our unions today. I'm not going to get into those details, but I'm going to talk about something else. But before I start doing that, let me make a disclaimer here. I am a union member in favor of a strong democratic union. I am for reforming the union, any corrupt union to become a union that it was supposed to be. I am from Local 1000. This local is corrupt to the core, and I stand beside my brothers and sisters out there about doing something with this union. I stand beside those who are concerned those union members who are concerned and are willing to do something, take the first step, encourage other people, encourage other people and empower them. Tell them there is no fear about anything. All you have to do is stand up. Once you stand up and you're not bent over, they cannot ride over you. That's all you have to do. But don't, as Ed said here very beautifully, don't label me anti-union if I'm saying something opposing the views that you have, if I'm pointing out the corruption. So all we are saying is we want our union back. If this union is like probably not other locals, is member-run union should be mem union of members, by members, for members. Isn't that correct? So we are here and we are stood up and we are fighting and we want to do something to get our union back. It is very easy. I look at everything that was said today and listen to everything that was said today. Ren told us from way up there, bird eye view, where AFL CIO was and how Andy Cern came and split the union. I call that anti unionism, putting a wedge and cracking unionism. And then, what are the things that he said that he wanted to pull out of AFL CIO? He was complaining about the same thing that we did and we are doing today. Lack of democracy, depriving members of their rights, giving power back to the members, uniting members to become union. Does he know how to spell union? Union is about united people. I have to do a fundraising and I expect every one of you to participate. A fundraising that I want to buy those earpieces, ear aids, or something to give to these people that they listen to people. People have risen and yelling and screaming and shouting, as Dan said, revolting. And then our union leaders, like Jim Hard, three, like about two days ago, three days ago had an interview with Capital Weekly here. After all has been said through CSE United, Roar people, other DLCs throughout California, he said at the very end, you can go to Capital Weekly and read it for yourself. If I know what these reformers want, I haven't heard them, if I know if they want, I might consider it. He has hearing problem, and we need to drill a hole that it goes, what we say goes through that. But maybe, maybe 
We are not roaring loud enough. We are not having a voice loud and strong enough that they hear us in Sacramento, they hear us in South, and get together and make it louder that they hear us in Washington, D.C. and Eastern. So if you look at it, we start from very bottom, from DLC 786, and let's go up, which is going to be all these DLCs. What are the problems that we have? Today we are struggling and having fight for our rights, rights to democracy. We want our votes, right to vote as a member. We want dues increase to be rescinded. And we want to say that we don't want to stop there because the fallacy is this. Dues were too much to begin with. 93,000 people are giving dues, and we are, by the way, organized. We didn't, you don't need any organizing. All you need to do is show good faith, let them democratic vote. Once democratically they vote and participate, you're going to have more and more members. Once you deprive them, once you be a dictator, they fall out. Look at the number of the members that are falling out of a union. Unionism in the United States has a problem, and the rate of members that are resigning, getting out of union, is alarmingly high. And we should stop that. Maybe, as Dan said, they are doing us a favor. I totally agree with him. As Ren said, they don't believe in this sort of thing. Look at what Dina said. And all of the struggles that they have had. And everything that Ed told you as far as the whole philosophy and everything, history behind this SEIU Local 1000 is absolutely true. We are members of CSEA, California State Employees Association, and we are proud of it. They were weak at a time, and they had faults, and we are getting back together to make it a strong and a stand, and a stand so hard that people like Jim Hart and Kathy Hackett cannot go and, as they have vowed, to destroy it. That is our backbone, that is our roots, and we are going to stick to it. So if that, we look at that, we look at the DLC, and then we go to local and locals, and we go to national level. We shouldn't stop there. We should ask Steve Seltzer, who is internationally, who is internationally involved with union, with unionism and labor movements. Today, if we unite, everybody out there is a labor, some sort or another. Where is our power? Where is our power? Why they don't, they don't take us serious? We need to take action. We need to give a new meaning to unionism. What they have done, and I should give them credit. I give credit to the leaders that they are leading our local today. Jim Hart and Kathy Hackett. They are wonderful, very, very competent, beautiful sheep herders. <laughs> sheep herders, I should say, they do a wonderful job as long as they have sheep, herds of them, they are comfortable. V vote this way, meh, and vote that way, meh, don't you like him, meh, and this goes on and on. Do you want to be sheep? Meh, we are tigers. We have to go and become that tiger. We should Roar! Lions and lioness. You are absolutely right. This is the problem that we have. It's so basic. It's so small. Is 
so simple. We have serious problem. We need serious people. And we don't need that many of them, believe it or not. As Dan promised and told you, as a Steve, as my mentor has told me many, many, many times, be patient, communicate, inform and educate other people more than anything else. Create a cause, a cause worthy enough that people get behind it and get passionate. I want to give you one example, share with you an experience that some of us from DLC 786 of Local 1000 are here today. I formed a group named ROAR. Rise to organize against race. In a DLC with 19 delegates that never ever they had a delegate to run on CSE United ticket. This last election, 19 of us on CSE United ticket, reformers, and 19 of them. 18 out of 19 was ours, way on the top, then all of a sudden drops. Is one of theirs tied with 19, at 19 position with ours, and I was observer there, nobody pulled anything out of hat, and they chose their representative. And then I, we protested and they didn't do anything. But that is very, very impressive, don't you think? Yeah. All we did was we roared. We let other people do what they're supposed to do. Listen, get excited, support us, and we won. Today, because I'm, once in a while I'm going to look into the cameras because we are going to send a copy of this DVD to Jim Hart, Kathy Hackett, and Andy Stern. I want them to shake in the boots when they look at it. They are scared and afraid of the movement of the Roar and CSC United, and they label us with things, stupid things like anti-union. Anti-union is the person like Andy Stern, like Jim Hard and Kathy Hackett, who are making the foundation of this union weak, they're tearing the whole fabric of unionism apart. They yell and scream and profess about democracy. I bet you anything, if you bring them here and ask them to spell democracy, they can't. And myself, as a former damn foreigner, can spell it. We need to stand beside each other and do something. As Steve said, one man can do a lot because we are American. The reason that I came to this country and proud of this country and became a citizen is because of a constitution. Because of a constitution that protects me. I have rights. I have labor rights. I am not the slave of Jim Hart and Kathy Hackett and the puppets of Andy Stern. And because of that, I can ask for more rights. I did it once. I took it all the way to Supreme Court and won. <laughs> I won a precedent-setting case, established free speech on the internet. The very right that CSE, you, CSE, I, see, I'm sorry. I'm not talking about, I shouldn't, as a matter of fact, I have to correct my SEIU and AFL-CIO were two supporters of mine. SEIU wrote this, that if Ken Hamidi loses this case, we are going to lose the right to send emails and communicate through internet with our members. That is the meekest brief that they wrote, and I bought that right for them. Do you think I can be called anti-unionism? I have worked with unions, unions nationally, internationally, with the Steve for a long time. Ladies and gentlemen, I make it short and I want to invite you to do something. From the lesson that we learned from what we did at Franchise Tax Board, 
We need to take action. We need to begin with, get rid of fear. Identify those who are ripping us off. Bring charges against them. We need a new sheriff in town. We need to bring charges and we need to get those outlaws and put them behind a bar. I want to ask Steve if he does a favor and post these here, if you don't mind. <laughs> Please. And this is, uh, you know, for I think, Ren, you, you get, you love this. Andy is still wanted. Please take care of that. And here we have Jim Hart and Kathy Hackett. We are going to do that, and I'm going to tell you in a second what is coming. A new sheriff is coming. And here is the next one, Jim Hart. And they are charged with this. They are wanted for selling us, selling out union members, for derelict of their fiduciary duties, for betraying and backstabbing union members, for lying and deceiving union members, for being corrupt and getting other people corrupted, for misappropriation of funds, for depriving union members of their democratic rights, for being unaccountable, and for promoting lack of transparency, for being inefficient and ineffective, destroying our union, being untrustworthy, and for being weasels. <laughs> this page did not have room that I go ahead and put the other charges. So this is what we're going to do. In a few days, a new website is going to be up and running. SOS1000.org. SOS1000.org stands for Sunlight on SEIU 1000. In this package that you see, I'm holding documents that no allegation, no accusation is going to be made to these people without substance. Stealing money through controller's office from other unions. Misappropriation of funds, not once, twice or three times. Buying years of retirement with union funds. Spending money, money like you wouldn't believe, all documented here, and we are going to show you. We're going to show you that a union that has 93,000 members and collecting fair share and also union dues from members, and was it $40 million that we had every year, the revenue was, or 43? 43, and they went for an increase of 50% to the dues. And how much they're going to get, Alex? Is it going to be in tune of 53 or 56? 93,000 members. And after five years, we got a lousy raise of 3.4% the and 3.2%. If you divide that by years, you're going to see it's not even close to increasing cost of living. If you look at other unions that we are going to reform this union, learn from them, how do they do that? Is this. Fewer members, lower dues, but being efficient, being competent, being honest, and do not misappropriate the funds. I have so many to tell you, and you know a lot of them. One of them is attorneys' unions and the rest of them. The reason is that they do not send 40% of it to Andy Stern to build an empire. How can you explain if you're a union leader that you're paying $14,000 for the rent every month 
and you have a lot of space and you have to reduce the size of the stuff that you're doing for nothing into some other list that you're going to get us into from $60,000 to $89,000 a month. That is a stupidity. This is a beautiful, gorgeous apple. I love it. It's tasty. One of you is going to have it, whoever wants to have it. The reason that I brought it here is this. This apple is symbol of one thing. There was a seed one day and had a potential to be grown into something like this. We as union members are that seed. Our union and what we get out of it, the product should be something as beautiful as this apple. You cannot get that seed and plant it in desert and you expect this. Corruption, lack of responsibility, accountability, lack of transparency, lack of democracy is going to kill that tree. I have a good news for you. A greenhouse is the best place to get the most potential. A greenhouse is the union, a union that is spelled U-I. Union. Can somebody spell it for me? <laughs> N-I-O-N. I'm sorry. It's spelled U-N-I-O-N. United. And that means if we have members who participate, who care, who want to sacrifice their time, energy, and resources, they can come in and they have light, humidity, and everything needed to grow something like this. It is doable. And we can get together and do that. Thank you very much for listening to me today. I want to thank all those people who came this long distances. It is wonderful to be amongst you. It is encouraging. And I tell you, as Dan said, if it wasn't because of them, we wouldn't be here. That is a good sign. And that means that unionism has to change the direction. We need to unite again. And we need to take action. We need to go after people who are doing that. We shouldn't wait that they get elected to the offices and then they do something that we do and we whine and complain and bicker. We need to roar.